Thank you. Um, okay, so the subject of my presentation will be the unemployment in the Eurozone and some of the winners and losers and some of the reasons standing behind that from an Austrian perspective. Um, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking about first speaking about Spain, but then I discovered David and I'm covering the Spanish crisis heavily, so then that dropped off, so my presentation would be probably a bit shorter than I expected it to be at the beginning. Um, so, um, first of all, I would like to give you a short recap of the Austrian business cycle theory, just to put what I'm going to say next into a bit of context. And then I'm going to go through three cases of uh, European countries from the Eurozone that, um, well, managed the crisis differently in terms of unemployment and, and, and had some, um, yeah, results that we can learn from. Um, so first of all, I'm not really sure if you could raise your hand if anybody of you that already knew at least what, what Dr. Mahai would call a pop version of the Austrian business cycle theory, so, so that you knew the basics, if you could raise your hand now. You consider yourself that you, that you know basically what's it about. Okay. Okay, I see, slight, I guess slightly above 50%. So, okay, so just, just very briefly. Um, so basically what does the Austrian business cycle theory say about uh, the business cycle? Um, we have a trend in GDP. Then what happens in a certain moment is that monetary authorities lower the interest rate below what would be what Austrians consider the natural interest rate. So um, the one that would evolve on the market naturally from an, an interplay of people's savings and people uh, wanting to borrow money. So then the monetary authority lowers the interest rate at a certain moment before uh, under the, below the, below the uh, natural level and that yields with a boom because there are extra there is extra monetary, monetary capital, let's say, that is available for, uh, for borrowers. They can engage in, in extra investments. So we have a boom. After we have a boom, at a certain moment, there are several mechanisms that interplay. Um, basically what happens is that, well, the reality kicks in. It turns out that the, the natural rate of the interest that would come from the interplay between savings and people willing to borrow um, would be different, which makes um, when in reality kicks in the way that shows that the actual resources weren't saved to uphold the investments, right? Because that's the entire idea behind the interest rate. There are some real resources that somebody saved, and a, a monetary shadow of that is the interest rate. So if you lowered it below the natural rate, what you get is not enough resources in comparison to the investment you undertook. So what happens is a bust. There, of course, this is a super simplified, super fast version. Um, it actually comes from some several, several things. Uh, the interest rates goes into the economy for a centered channel. Uh, the, the money from the from the extra credits go to the economy for a centered channel. Um, they go to, to to certain investment that were probably more risky because with a lower interest rate you can you can take undergo more risky investments. Uh, they are probably more uh, more lengthy because with a lower interest rate you can wait longer for the same yield. Um, so there are several structural issues with that. And on, this, and the, on the other side, you have the consumers that with a lower interest rate are less incentivized to uh, actually save because you, when you have a lower interest rate, then obviously you don't have that much of an incentive to put your money into a savings account and actually save the resources. Um, how does this affect uh, the labor market? Well, simply the entrepreneurs get the new credit they decide to undergo more risky, more lengthy, uh, basically different, uh, different production processes. So they go to the labor market to employ the cap to do to employ the labor. Plus, they get the capital, um, and that's where extra employment comes from in the boom phase. So when the resources, the real resources, run out, we, you have layoffs. You have the bust phase. Uh, there are, of course, several schools of economics that, that say different things should happen then. There are the, let's say, the active schools, which it would be both Keynesian economists and all their, all their brands and the monetarists that would also suggest some interventions. Um, and then there are the 
let's say, passive schools, which basically is the Austrians, uh, that would say probably that, yeah, well, since this, was act this is actually reality kicking in, we cannot really play any much more with reality since the, we could foil a bit with the, with the monetary veil before and, and make an illusion for the entrepreneurs that they have more resources to invest. But, I mean, there's a limit in cheating reality. Reality kicks in, so you have to restructure. And when you restructure, uh, you have to liquidate assets, so prices fall of the assets. And the other thing is usually you have layoffs in the labor market, so you have unemployment. Um, I figured I would talk about three well, previously four, but now three cases. Um, one would be France, the second one would be Germany, and the third one would be Estonia. Why such a, such a, uh, such a pick? Uh, well, basically, you will probably understand why I'll speak, but just briefly um, give an intro. I chose France as it shows a overall tendency to uh, follow the average European Union unemployment. And basically, the curves look exactly the same way. There's sometimes there's sometimes a gap, a bit of a gap, but usually they are very strongly correlated with the average EU. So, so they are a good proxy to understand the entire EU mechanism. Um, then we have Germany. Germany as the German miracle inside of the inside of the crisis. They basically don't have unemployment, uh, which probably is something that we can learn from in terms of policy prescriptions. Um, and then Estonia as a example of a free market economy, a transition economy that was given for many, many years as an example by free market economists, by Austrian economists, of the way that you can look, this, this, this is kind of putting the ideas into action. Uh, this is the, the Estonian uh, economic miracle. And then in the crisis, Everything exploded. Unemployment skyrocketed, and 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 there were all the people that, that would usually be against free market policies were saying, "Aha, got it. That, that's that's the way. That, that's why you were wrong because your uh, your prescriptions were unstable, inherently unstable. Now you have unemployment because crazy capitalism, blah blah blah. Everything exploded in your face. Ha! Especially especially Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, was one of those people doing aha. And that's why I want to go a bit deeper into that case and, and, and show you why I think he, well, was a bit too fast to celebrate his success with that one. Um, so let's start with France. Um, I'm going to be showing you some charts from different sources. Um, so I'm not always agreeing with the lead on it. But just in, so, 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 so you can see where, where it's from and what, 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 what was the, let's say, the author's bias or the author's, um, the author's uh, idea when, when putting graph on. Uh, we can see here the European Union unemployment average in blue. And then we can see France, as I said, quite strongly correlated. Here it goes just hand by hand, exactly in the same point, uh, or almost exactly at the same point right now. Um, you would also see what I mentioned as the German miracle here. A bit of a rise in unemployment, just as the Austrians would expect at, at the moment of the bust. But then, for some reason, unemployment goes down and basically Germany is, has, has it as good as ever. Um, so, the France, French labor market has historically been sluggish. Um, you can see this is a um, this is a um, chart showing you the change of unemployment one year after the start of recovery. And the, the, so the recession is defined as two um, two quarters of negative uh, growth of the economy, and then of, of uh, negative growth of the economy, and then after after that is the turnaround. Um, you can see that the unemployment in in, in these countries was usually still. Um, higher while, and for example, countries like Australia, United US, Germany, it would usually, you would already see a recovery happening. Um, well, what is one of the strong reasons for what's happening in France is actually the composure of the labor market there. Um, it's based on what they call a dual, what the authors of this report currently were, were calling a dual model. 
uh, one which they had long-term contracts that were resilient, basically, which means that when you got employed for a permanent contract, you were sticking to the job for a long period of time. And then you had the temp labor, which was actually much more elastic. It was easier to um, be removed from the uh, from the enterprise, and thus, and thus, when you had the unemployment growing, it was mostly the temporary part that was being laid off because there were some legal uh, constraints against from uh, for, uh, against um, uh, laying off people that were on the long term contracts. Um, actually, this is um, this is exactly a sign of uh, a. Uh, a overregulated labor market from uh, from the an uh, overregulated market from the labor perspective. Um, the biggest um, who knows who is the biggest um, provider of temporary work uh, in Europe currently? They have offices in Wrocław, so for because I know a big bunch of you is from Wrocław. Um, an intermediary that offers you uh, temporary work. Anybody? Exactly. That's manpower. And who knows which European market is biggest for manpower? Poland. No, it's France. The biggest supplier. The biggest, what did I say? The biggest supplier of the manpower workforce. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the biggest, the, the biggest market for them is France. Exactly due to the fact that the temporary work providers are not binded um, from an entrepreneur perspective through that long term. Uh, contract that is virtually very hard to break in inside of French law, French, French law. So they decide to take the temp labor from manpower um, and then just break the contract with manpower and then it's the trouble of manpower to do whatever they fit to do with the labor. Um, and that's well, the first key point here is um, basically if you want a recovery and if you want the process in the market economy to start the restructuring, you should probably have flexible labor. Um, well, I'll tell you, if you don't, and if you don't have flexible labor, what you will get is a uh, big is is that the big share of the labor force will be actually uh, be employed in a way that tries to circumvent your legal um, your legal uh, structure and your legal constraints uh, against against the entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs are basically smart, and they know that if it's hard to, to lay off somebody, they are probably not going to employ them that much. Um, and yeah, if, if, if they need to restructure, and they actually expected a need to be flexible, they will probably not employ the people on the long-term contract, but prefer something like manpower. Um, another thing that is uh, quite important in, for the French labor market is that France has the highest public social expenditure of all OECD economies, right? This, uh, this is actually, uh, in, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, I thought kind of not here, but this actually includes all the social benefits, including, um, uh, including the ones for the, what you get when you get laid off, what you get when you get sick, um, help for um, help for mothers, um, uh, for orphans. So the, the whole public social expenditure. This is the highest number, uh, which probably can explain part of the fact that then from, from one side it's hard to lay off somebody, but on the other hand, when somebody isn't actually in the active labor force, he's probably not very strongly incentivized to actually look and help out the entrepreneurs in the restructuring process of the entire economy because, well, he's probably pretty well off if 28% of GDP goes for public social expenditures. Um, so that's basically the um, French picture. Um, the first chart I was showing you, we can replicate it here. This is the, we're going to use Google Data because it's nice and interactive and it can show you nice animations. Uh, so here we have the European Union average, um, and then if we add France to that, it's almost the same picture, probably a bit different data used. So again, meeting almost right now. Oh yeah, this is this is this is from this is updated for uh, June two thousand twelve, January two thousand twelve. So a bit outdated, but still you can easily see the trend. Um, so this is France, and this. It's Germany. As you can see, Germany actually in 2005 um, 
by I'm choosing uh, 2005, let's maybe even wider a bit. Um, let's say the crisis started in 2008. Um, now we have 2013, that's five years, so let's type from 2003. So nobody tells me that I'm cherry picking my graphs and just choosing something that fits in the picture. Um, as you can see, I mean, the Germans aren't perfect. They had their own unemployment problems in 2005. But then, when we would come to the peak of the boom and just before the bust, everything was going down nicely for all. Then we have just something like a year of problems for Germany. And when everybody else went slow, they turned. So now the question is, why would they turn? Um, basically, the years 2003, 2005, 2006 are a period of intensive labor market reforms in Germany, started by Chancellor Schroeder. Um, and what, what, what did the Germans do? They, they did actually um, a series of reforms that we would consider, um, yeah, that probably any free market uh, economist could sign off, probably not, in, perhaps not in terms of scope. Probably there would be some view here that would say this is not enough, but still the general idea was very good and, and, and provided a very flexible labor market after the reforms were actually instated. So basically what they did was they uh, reduced the, uh, the mandatory payments for the healthy system. It was, it was before it was 14.5% uh, of the salary, now it's 12. Um, they uh, reduced um, they uh, they reduced demand for public uh, for public healthcare by introducing copay, which basically induced the people to uh, not overburden the health system. Which, on the other hand, uh, redu reduced the necessity of getting the money from the people and imposing an extra cost on labor. Right. So copay copay basically means that that if you don't really need to go to the doctor, you probably won't because you have to pay a bit from your own pocket. Right? So if you do that, you get less expenditure in, in healthcare. If you get less expenditure in healthcare, you can afford to tax the employers less for the labor for covering the healthcare. Um, they had uh, labor tax cuts. Uh, they had a reform of the pension system. Um, they reduced the benefits time for people unemployed. So it's actually pretty interesting that this is exactly a year here. Because currently, the benefits you get if you're unemployed in Germany are for a year. And then you lose them. Uh, if you're elderly, it's for 18, I mean elderly, if you're above 55, I think, it's uh, it's 18 months, right? But but if you're below 55, it's only a year. Of course, this is probably a bit of an accident, right? <laughs> I'm not implying that exactly this year is due to that factor, but it's actually kind of a convenient thing to show here. Um, so, and so another thing, they flexibly, they, they made, they made uh, the labor force more incentivized to actually look for their jobs. Uh, they, uh, they made the, they made the contract law much more flexible in terms of, uh, hiring and laying off people. The labor contract flexibility was higher and there were, there were added extra forms of contractual employment than they had before. So you could, um, Depending on your situation, avoid some payments, some some social security, some taxes by employing people in, some, in certain ways. Um, they did uh, a big restructuring of their f uh, of their um, federal, I guess uh, that's the word in English, of their federal labor office, um, which they 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 said from now on we are going to be mimicking basically. Manpower. <laughs> we, they, we are going to be mimicking uh, private uh, solutions for uh, finding jobs for people, and they did. They did big studies. I mean, of course, it's a bit of playing in playing market. It's probably not the perfect solution, but still, at least it shows a certain mindset that they come to the thought that probably the market solution for labor market problems is actually better than than a normal market one. So at least if we have to have the labor office, let's mimic as much as we can the market solutions. Um, except for that, they created something that's, um, yeah, I'm not going to attempt using the German word, but it's, uh, it's uh, what they called uh, working accounts, which basically means that there is a certain flexibility in manufacturing if you're employed in, in a manufacturing company. Um, and there is a period of intense 
work need. Uh, you get to pay, you get to work more, and then it's kind of accounted for you that you get to work more, and then you can reduce your work in a different month and still get a continuous stream of payments. Um, it was it was formalized in the law and 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 uh, gave a ton of flexibility to, to the German manufacturers, uh, which is extremely important for Germany since pretty much of their current GDP structure is based on exports of high quality. Uh, heavily processed uh, in industry, so, so things like semiconductors, things like uh, processed machines, and also specialty chemicals, which are actually some things that require a ton of um, specialized engineering, and, and, and you probably are not going to be outsourcing producing it to China. Um, and actually, one of their mo biggest um, recipients is China, because that's exactly the quality of the engineers and of the capital that they lack there, so, so they import um, some some small stuff from from China and then and then reassemble and, and add their own stuff and then the heavily processed stuff from the big manufacturers in, in Germany gets shipped out back to China um, and those and the labor accounts were exactly aimed at, the, at that part of the of the German economy to, to enhance them and become more flexible uh, in rough times um, of course. The labor market, I mean, only the regulations of the labor market don't explain all in terms of the um, unemployment there. There are several structural issues, right? They, they, as I mentioned, for, for one thing, exports, um, heavy capital intensity, and actually a, 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 a long culture of, um, of, of, well, being one of the most, uh, being one of the most developed countries in the world. So, so it's probably easier for them to implement, um, structural things in the labor market, but still, um, if there's something to learn from that, is that it was extremely successful, and they actually, they actually, um, as we can see, they see a, 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 a unemployment of, now uh, this is actually, but this, this is old, they should, they should be around 4% now. Um, right, so, this is France, this is Germany, and my last stop, as I mentioned, will be Estonia. The picture gets a bit messy. So what do we have here? Here we have the Estonian miracle. Right? So basically what every, every free market in the world were saying, yes, finally somebody is doing our stuff and it works. We have a good case study. And we're not going to get the question of, but where do they implement it? Did they do it anywhere in the world? Yes, they did in Estonia. And then 2008 comes and we all say, damn it, <laughs> we have a problem with our case study, apparently, because boom, it explodes almost at 20%. Um, well, the, the economists that are not exactly free marketers rejoice um, and then say, well, basically, Look at the look at the look at what 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 so some, some even actually say said that uh, those were Austrian economics policies, which is which is a bit ridiculous. Um, but yeah, the, 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 in a rhetoric as a rhetorical device, it was used that this is proof that the Austrian solutions are inherently unstable because in the crisis you're extremely you're not very resilient against uh, against problems. Um, but what we're going to see here is this is 2008, we have a peak in the middle of 2009, and then we're going to march trend going down, 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 down. At this chart of the end of 2011, it's a bit of about the European Union average. Um, so actually, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Estonia uh, was actually saying, look, we implemented um, some what was called austerity measures. Uh, I bet Matheus is going to have a couple of thing, bad things to say about austerity in Europe in, 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 in the next lecture. Uh, but still, what they did, they basically they were cutting taxes and they were um, increasing revenues. So, so basically, they, they increased their, their value added tax and um, in order to stabilize the budget. Um, but actually, there wasn't that much things to do with the labor market because it was already quite elastic. Um, so the, the Estonian prime minister was saying that this is actually a success story. We have been strongly hit due to, probably from an outside perspective, due to monetary factors. And, and this is probably a nice case study of how 
um, how very good fiscal policy and structural policy can get a hit from bad monetary policy here, but this is, this is an object for, for a different lecture. Um, but even in the case of being hit so strong, uh, being, a, um, being a transition economy, we still are flexible enough that we don't really get too much protesters going out on the streets and the trends reverses and let's say light seems to, the, the, the night seems to end and the day comes back. But of course they are, there are naysayers, our favorite uh, Paul Krugman, um, well, he exactly heard what I just told you, something probably something in the, in, 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 in the terms of what I told you, and he said, no, 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 look, uh, this is actually not true. Uh, there, if you cannot argue, possibly this is a success story of austerity, because first of all, they, their current GDP level is still fairly below uh, their 2007 levels, so they actually didn't recover. Um, which actually is something that, that that we also right we can we can we can see it here that still this is higher than what we see anywhere here. Um, so so this is actually not really a success story. Um, it's uh, it's difficult, but if you have a recession and you have a strong dive, then afterwards you probably have quite a bit of momentum and 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 a way to to get let's say cheap growth. It's easy it's easy to get back. From, from, from very low levels because, well, the, the marginal benefit you get from each investment unit is probably much higher because there is a lot of free labor force, a lot of uh, free capital. So at the beginning, it's easy to start investment after all that liquidation took place because you have cheap labor, cheap capital. So it's obvious that you're going to have a jump. Come on, this is nothing about austerity. This is just common sense. Um, well, I think that Walker well, one was a bit too fast with his, uh, with his um, assessment. Let's look at the euro area. This is the latest data. I'm, I'm moving away from that chart because it, it ended with, with, with the end of 2011. This is the average view. For some reason that I really didn't delve in the this flat ends out, I suggest some statistical artifact because I really don't believe that this is this flat for such a long period of time, but that's a different thing. Um, so we, what we see here is what? 11, 7, 11, 8, 12, 12.1. And this is Sonia. This is Sonia already surpassing the European Union average in unemployment. Um, and reaching the levels, well, almost, of this is 8, this is 9. Right? So, of course, it's still not exactly there yet, but there is no reason to believe that if things would, were to go on like this and if there wasn't any addition terminal for monetary structural blah blah, and so on of other factors that are going to obviously mess up this picture, but there is no really um, point in arguing that this should stop and, and that their their policies were not a success. It's a economy that is strongly interrelated with uh, a ton of uh, other economies in the European Union and worldwide. Um, they were a small economy, a transition economy. They got hit very bad and yet shown very strong resilience and already surpassed the European average and are actually better off than France, for example, or any other average European company. Um, and for the real GDP, and you can even see the picture. Um, this is Estonia. So you can see um, this is not. Oh, here we go. This is what I wanted to show. So here we have it. We have 2012 with 9.5, we have 2008 with 9.5. 2007 with 9.9, .9, so just a bit above in terms of real GDP per capita. Of course, there is not a clear translation between GDP and unemployment, but still the trend is correlated and you can str strongly see exactly the same movement, both in unemployment and in GDP. So probably Paul Krugman was a bit too fast to be, um, to be very, um, yeah, very happy about how, how Estonia is a case study against, um, against austerity and against a flexible 
labor market and against reducing uh, G reducing public budget expenditures. Um, okay, just to then to recapitulate. Um, the Austrian business cycle theory is a theory that shows you how monetary um, monetary influences can get into the real factors and how monetary uh, monetary disturbances influence the entrepreneurs in making mistakes in terms of where the real resources should be. Um, when it happens, it happened. The misallocations happened. There is, we, we cannot rewind time and say, okay, look, you shouldn't employ these guys, you shouldn't invest in this or that. It already happened, so there has to be a transition period. The point is only how that transition period is going to look like. The labor market is an extremely important part in that transition, not only due to economical factors, but also due to the fact that it is people that are going out to the streets and protest in case of things going very, very bad. So it is extremely important for the labor force to restructure and for the labor market to actually bounce back. Uh, because pro that would probably prevent a run of historical events, um, just to uh, invoke the standard cliche about the Nazi Germans getting to power due to the Great Depression and due to the um, very bad labor market situation, then perhaps if the markets were elastic and were allowed to quickly bounce back in a year or year and a half, perhaps the political trade Europe would look much different. What you can learn from the cases that we have seen is that, well, probably making it difficult to uh, lay off people is a good way to, um, good way to keep your uh, unemployment high, uh, that there, the reforms are possible even, even if they are difficult, even if they are require making people co-pay for health insurance and to reduce the promised benefits. Um, and they are doable. They show effects, and that is probably a path that, irrespective to what we think of monetary theory or, or the business cycle theories as a whole, this is probably something that will be good, irrespective of what you believe in. And with that, I would like to open to question. Thank you. I have a very number question about the three comments. Uh, you show the GDP per capita data. But actually, if you look at the GDP data for Estonia, it's uh, actually not at the level of 2009, not even 2008, uh, a little bit lower than 2008. The reason is that when a country is hit by a recession, it's uh, a normal course of events that people, people are uh, running away, right? as the case um, with Irish. The Irish unemployment is going down, but the reason is that the Irish people speak English so they can uh, go to the United States to find, find work there. So I'm not really sure if looking at the uh, GDP per capita data is a, a good way to, to do this. And if you look at the uh, GDP data, uh, there is a slight fall. Uh, between 2012 and 2013, at least I think 2013 is a, in part a forecast, but I'm not sure if the real picture mm. is uh, as good as you, as you said. Right, okay. So I'll admit that probably you're right, that per capita is probably a bit misleading, although I, I fairly doubt that it would be explanatory by explained by people running away, because if this is getting to the same levels as here, and you're saying it's below... No, no, yeah. I mean, it's, it cannot be explained by that no, alone, is, right? Is, well, I look at the data and I see that it is the GDP uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the whole country is below the 2008, well, well, it's not significantly, but, uh, but still, I guess that uh, since Estonia is such a small country, and a, a, even a small change in a uh, absolute number of people who are uh, who are um, mm, leaving the country will be mm -hmm. a significant uh, significant uh, effect. Right. Will have a significant mm -hmm. effect on, on the, the real GDP per capita. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I do not claim that this mm -hmm. uh, falsifies your claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely right. 
that's probably that's probably not the best metric. Um, but just then to have a bit of con bit of context and 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 just uh, not to make the uh, not not to make the whole statements when you actually have a good point with the consistency of the data is that if we look at these are uh, these are GDP growth rates then right and if we look at the figures for 2012 and the and the projections you have four percent for Estonia here and then if we can just see them not really going very deep into who is who is where we can see boom 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 here we have six and seven five let's see who those guys are Oh wow, let's fail Lithuania, exactly the guys that were mimicking Estonia <laughs> and doing actually very similar things and are usually bought together as as a joint <laughs> as a joint project, exactly. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so 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 you have a point and, and that's true probably I, I should if, if I'm gonna present this some some other time I should probably re emphasize these points a bit different, but I think the overall point still holds, and, and actually, if you, if you look at the growth rates, and, and that was basically my idea of, the, of showing the tendency, because I'm not really talking about GDP, right? I, my, I was talking about unemployment. Um, so, if you, if you look at the tendency, I mean, I mean, I, I, I still strongly believe that the GDP tendency, when you look at the growth rates in comparison to the eurozone, still confirms that path strongly to recovery in terms of. I actually have another comment. Mm. And uh, uh, you show us the data on the um, social, uh, sorry, government expenditures as mm -hmm. a percentage of GDP. It was one of the PDF files. Mm -hmm. And it caught my eye that Germany actually has a rather high uh, public social expenditure right. GDP rate. Although, one thing is this is 2007 data. Yeah. For France, in the meanwhile, it actually grew, while in Germany, the opposite is true. <laughs> so, yeah, that's. Probably this is this this gets mixed up a bit by the time the timing of this. But as I mentioned, they actually reduced those due to the due to the exactly the, the reforms from 2003 2008. Um, they reduced those uh, those values while France did exactly the opposite. So it's a question of dynamics, I guess. Also, because obviously, I mean, there is a certain if, if you look at it like Ceteris Paribus, there is a certain level you are at, right? You you can have a very bad let's say, labor market, but for other reasons, you're very strong still, right? So then it's all about the dynamics, because, well, apparently if you're very capital intensive, if you have a lot of capital goods, blah, 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 very productive economy, and you have a bad labor market, you can still manage at a certain level, but then when, when things go bad, you have to change the dynamics on that to, to, to compare it from the, from the point you were beginning at. So may I have just a follow-up question of it? But, um, did you try to look at the, uh, for example, nominal expenditures for these countries? Mm -hmm. uh, because it seems to me that in part a German miracle, as it is, it's not caused in one hundred percent by the, you know, a, a uh, miracle policies by uh, Councillor Schroeder. Uh, or uh, that uh, the Germans are very prudent nation, but in fact that the European Central Bank, well, is promoting growth in Germany uh, uh, by doing pro-German monetary policy. Do you, do, do you have an opinion on this? Well, let's say it like this. Um, there is quite a strong possibility. I mean, it's not something that I was, I was really researching for this one, um, so, so I don't want to make any bold sweeping statements, but there is Probably a pretty strong possibility that what you're saying is correct in the sense that the EBC had a long history of actually doing stuff like that. So basically supporting the guys that were politically strong and, um, and, and doing things like that. However, however, um, I still think that um, even if, if you look at it like that, um, there is a, let's say, a certain... If you look at the unemployment rates, I don't, I don't have that actually in one of the exhibits, but if, if you look at the unemployment rates in the, in the EU, you can basically see um, the countries that, that are going down are very, very, very strong, and then you have Germany in the middle being strong, and then kind of fades away if you put in colors, it's, it's Germany strong in the very peripheries, and then kind of middle ground in the middle. Um, and I mean, explaining it only through, through EBC operations seems a bit 
from my perspective, a, 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 a bit, bit too much. Basically, because I mean, EBC uh, policies have been having also a record of actually not hitting the target that they were aiming at. A very long record of doing that. But that's one thing. And the other thing is that also in a crisis situation, and, and this is again, this is again about the monetary part and, and not really related part. This I didn't want to let go in. Uh, but um, if, if you really look at it from a, from a monetary perspective, then you obviously you cannot not take into account the fact that, for example, Germany is a place that uh, had a big uh, movement of capital towards it, basically because it was a strong, and, and, and I mean, and it, and it wasn't because of the EBC. It was because of the good state of the German banks. Two questions from the back. So, uh, if you want to look for alternative explanation of increasing the German unemployment, look, look up an article in uh, Economic Affairs on arts for reforms. I think it's, it's a little bit uh, of a bit how, how successful these reforms were. Uh, the article is arguing quite convincingly that the, the single most important uh, criteria, criteria or, or, or feature uh, responsible for increasing the, the, the unemployment was the uh, uh, declining real wages, which started even before during the 90s and it had to do with the uh, uh, decreasing the power of German labor unions, etc. etc. The, the, the hard for reforms could have contributed somewhat, but it was uh, none of the partial reforms had, uh, had, any, had any greater success or even this. Agencies or the manpower agencies that you were referring to. Didn't, didn't Frankly, that real wages hypothesis doesn't isn't really very convincing to me. I mean, if we look at it from a wider perspective, then I mean, we have a flat thing here. Let's say with certain rollbacks of, of around two percent until two thousand four. If that would be the argument, why doesn't it show up in the data before? I mean, then. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to talk trash on a on a title by itself. But economic affairs. Uh, I, I'm not going. I'm not going to discuss a paper. I don't know. But so those method, methodology or anything But uh, they are showing that these hard for reforms. Okay. Uh, uh, not singularly. That, that, that yeah. Of course. I mean, it's never a single. I, I. I would never. Of course, I would never argue anything like that. But the point is that. Um, you would usually from, hear from a labor perspective, if, if, you, if you took, for example, the Keynesian economist or something, you would hear, no, give the people benefits, because then they have more purchasing power, they consume, boom, 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 the, the economy starts going, right? When, when what they did actually, were, where they did the reverse, they said they, they reduced what they got, what, what the people were getting in the same time, right? They reduced the spending on their own side, so reduced the push from the, if you look at the traditional GDP uh, equation, right? It's consumption, investment, government expenditure, right? They, they reduced G, they reduced what, what the Keynesian would say would be increasing C. So the real wages don't really convince me too much in this perspective, if, if it's supposed to be from the 90s. I'm not really very convinced about it, yeah, but, but I, I'm, not, I'm not going to make any sweeping statements because I don't know it, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean we can we compare empirical observations, uh, the, the exact casual, casual chains, the chains of reasoning, but, but okay. Although Maybe it was a mixture of Oh, I mean, it, it, it definitely was a mixture. There's like no point in arguing it wasn't, right? Yeah. The only point is that if you get something completely opposite than one of the economic recommendations and still it's good, then probably those economic recommendations aren't that important. That's that's kind of the takeaway from this from this picture, from for me at least. Okay. Yeah, I have a question which is inspired from a report uh, on the French labor market. Mm -hmm. Most probably, unfortunately, available in French for 10 years ago. It was a very good report. 10 years ago? Yeah, something like this. You can see the reference. So, there are two very interesting things in this report. The first one was that every single day in France, 10,000 job contracts terminate, and 10,000 new job contracts are signed every single day. And the second thing was that uh, uh, small and medium enterprises are by far the largest provider of uh, job employment. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, from this they draw several conclusions. One, of course, was... So, so first, the, the major thing is that you can imply from this is that changes in the unemployment rate 
are basically due to changes in the net uh, <coughs> between uh, the new uh, uh, job contract signed and terminated. Then one of the elements which explains to what extent uh, the new contracts are voluntarily signed by people who sell labor is of course all the uh, social spending, unemployment benefits and so on which you covered in your presentation. But another very important argument uh, and element to take into account, as they say in their report, is the general creativity in the economy. How many uh, enterprises are being created? Uh, what, uh, and, uh, because, of course, job contracts are terminated when some businesses close down and so on. So it would have been, maybe, I don't know, maybe you did, so there's a question. Did you check the changes in uh, unemployment rates? Uh, did, did you try to compare them? So the changes in the stock of small and medium enterprises in France and Germany. And this of course relates to the entire business environment, mm -hmm. not only yeah. taxation of labor, but uh, general capacity to open new enterprises, taxation in any kind of capital also, and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. No, no, that, that, that's something I wasn't looking into actually in this, in this one. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's obviously a strong, a strong relationship between, between, let's say, the, the I would even say the, the capacity of a of a country to uphold creativity in, in entrepreneurship, right? In in the sense of really not interfering, because obviously, even if you have a um, let's say less creative traditionally country, um, then uh, and, and another country gets um, gets more of those creative entrepreneurs, and then they get the labor there, and then they build the companies there. That there should become uh, if if. Two countries would have the same institutional settings. They would probably have an arbitrage opportunity then, right? And because they would have more creativity here, so more employment for, from those creative entrepreneurs, and less here, so labor force, labor prices lower here, and then you would have arbitrage, right? So of course, so so it's a wider question of the overall um, overall um, yeah pos possibilities of actually entrepreneurship and 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 not getting trouble from um, in in running a business, yeah, absolutely. I've got that. Because uh, if you followed the debate on Estonian, you did probably more than me. I remember there was a post after Krugman that uh, from in 2011 that they adopted some fiscal stimulus, and so the unemployment rate falling from 2011, the normal case would say, oh, it's our policy and not free market policy, right? So it, it was thought that still the rate of unemployment was very high. Like, right. Which, which basically means that. I mean, uh, I, I remember that post on Krugman's blog. Uh, I didn't really go too much into it, but that shows you at least one strange thing in this debate, which basically is that first he said that apparently there is no success story because you're free market. Then when they showed him a success story, he says, oh, no, 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 it's actually a success story because of our policies, which probably means he's cherry picking the data. <laughs> to just show whatever he wants to show, and that's why I'm always a bit distrustful uh, when I look at it. Because, I mean, he, he just took the same data, right? He just said, there's no success story because it's a free market country, and then when they, and they showed him, look, it's a success story because the prime minister got really irritated by that one. I mean, like, really, he, he, he even went on the TV and, 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 and he had a press conference saying that, that Mr. Krugman perhaps believes that nobody in Estonia speaks English, so we will not know, but we know, and we are really frustrated by people talking trash about our economy and not knowing this stuff. So it's like really a big thing, and then they, they shot the data into him, and then he said, oh wait, actually it is a success story, but thanks to us. <laughs> that makes me really distrustful of, of the data he shows. That's true, but... Like, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I didn't go into that, so, so I mean, I, I cannot assess the quality of what he said, right? I, I'm just saying, but probably, it, it, whatever he's trying to say, he's very not inconsistent, and yeah, perhaps that's an interesting thing to go deeper into and have another lecture about. <laughs> Let us invite Krugman uh, for the next year. Yeah. Oh, it's, it would be a horror. He would just say. To have a new new Yeah. He didn't even want to go to debate Bob Murphy, even though he had like a hundred thousand dollars for poor people in New York. So, if, if they had a bet, that I mean, Bob Murphy is an Austrian economist that had this bet. He actually, I think it was on Kickstarter or something. He said that if we collect one hundred thousand dollars on for for the poor people in New York. Um, uh, then I, I will ask Paul Krugman to agree for a debate with me, and he, if he will debate me, that, that money will go full for the boss. So he wanted to blackmail him a bit into debating, and still he didn't do it, even though they had like 80,000 or something. So I don't think he will come. Uh, 
How, how do you find how does the single Polish leather market when you compare it with Germany, Estonia, and France? All right. The flexibility of the Polish labor market is a very tricky question, actually, um, because um, one thing is that um, I mean the, the labor contracts as themselves, um, I guess, are um, are in, in comparison to, to French French labor contracts are uh, are more flexible, but even more flexible are the the, the non work contracts. Right? So. so what we call a model of zero, etc. Right. So, so, so the other the other contacts that you get, and, and that actually is is pretty flexible. Um, I frankly, I'm uh, I'm probably gonna get a bit of pushback from some of my colleagues, but I'm actually an optimist in terms of, of Polish labor force uh, flexibility because of that. I mean, of course, you, you lose a lot of benefits if you go for those contacts, but still. Um, I, I, I consider the, and especially the, since there is a strong mindset, there, there was this research from one of the, the big, um, the big opinion pollers in, in Poland that, that the attitude towards those extra contacts is, is strongly changing and, uh, and people are actually sometimes even encouraging the employers to go for those contracts and not for the standard labor, labor contracts. So, I mean, I, I'm a relative optimist in terms of the Polish labor market flexibility, uh, thanks to those. Although, of course, it would be much, much more, much better if, if you could actually have a traditional labor contract and not really have to go. I mean, a workaround is always a workaround. But. Okay, first question. Last question. Okay, so actually, I have two questions. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, really simple, I guess. Uh, is there a um, qualitative index, sorry, a quantitative index that measures uh, wage flexibility across Europe? It is that uh, you can compare them because I know it's central leaders, but I I don't know. Okay, yeah, because I think this will be a uh, a good variable to include in a model, mm -hmm. right? Sure. To look at different explanations and look at different strand, uh, a strand of different uh, different variables. Sure. And uh, my second question is: uh, Did you look at the average uh, current account balance for uh, countries in Europe? It is. Uh, did you um, consider a possibility that a German miracle is actually caused by something else? Yeah, I mean, of course, of, of course. I, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned, there is like a ton of explanations for it, um, for, for our structural factors, and I, I mentioned that, that, for example, the flow of deposits, blah blah, right? The, the capital movement towards from the peripheries to Germany, and and the the super cheap bonds in the German economy, which caused actually low interest rates for actually kind of funded uh, savings and not unfunded ones. Um, so, so there are of course, there are of course uh, various, uh, various uh, elements here. Um, so, but I mean, if, if there would be a takeaway from looking at from, from, for example, from, from the savings perspective, I would say apparently what happened was that, that if, when they were funding the, their investments with with real savings that were flowing towards towards Germany from 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 various parts of Europe, however real they are, and however big, a ton of problems, of course, with identifying what is real, what's non real. But let's say that was a at least a a voluntary movement of capital, right? Then then uh, I mean in in that that is the that is the good. Uh, the, the, the world in which the Austrians would like to live, which, which, in which the investments are always funded by, by real investments. And of course, as I said, it's, it's ultimately about then the relative, relative point of view, because quite possibly, uh, even if you would take as constant the old labor regulations and then you would just have a heck load of investments, then yes, unemployment would go down. But definitely changing those things that, uh, make the labor force more flexible. Uh, make the, uh, because I mean, ca capital doesn't work on itself, right? Capital works with labor. So you have to have complementary issues. And if you want those complementary issues to work fast, and this, this in terms of economics is very fast, right? Uh, I, I mean, f f from all probably what, what would, uh, most people looking at the, at, at the lags between of the implementing of the policy and of the result, this is very fast. Um, so, if you want that complementary, you have to look at it from, from both sides, of course, right? Okay. Thank you.
but it wouldn't be possible if the labor market would be very rigged. And if it would be rigged, it would probably be slower, or we would have something like we have. Um, we would have something like we have in the UK, right, where we had this um, had this uh, here, and then it went flat, right. So I mean. Which, which is probably something in another show of, of, of how, um, I mean, these things, and of course, you mentioned measuring in a model the, the weight of the factors. Of course, you can try doing that, but uh, I don't think I recall a single, a single empirical study on, on, let's say, relationships like these that stand it for a longer period of time in terms of looking at it from hindsight. So I'm always very, very skeptical I'm, uh, at going too sophisticated with that stuff. I mean, it's interesting and, and you can do it, but still, I believe that the, I mean, a sum of positive effects will probably yield the positive effects. So, so if I, I, I was focusing here on the labor market regulations and I mean, there's no, uh, no questions that they have a positive effect. So yeah, we can try measuring, but as I said, I'm usually a bit skeptical about it and quite possibly this curve would be just a bit flatter or something like that. If, if you wouldn't have that, that typical Austrian complementary between the capital goods and the labor market. I will have a look at that because I don't think they have similar uh, regulation and I think monetary policy is very similar in Germany and Netherlands. Frankly, I have no idea. I didn't look into Germany, into the Netherlands. Um, so it's hard for me to comment. Yeah, we can see that apparently they have very low unemployment. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not really... I, I don't feel entitled to comment because I have no idea what's the, what the labor market structure or anything like that.